All right, chapter 20, section 2. Generators and alternating current. Yesterday, or last time we met, I had this coil up here, and I hooked it up to my galvanometer. And what's a galvanometer supposed to measure? Do you remember? <laughs> it doesn't matter galvans. <laughs> remember what a galvanometer measures? It starts with an A. Yeah, yeah. So it measures current. A galvanometer is just a, uh, a um, sensitive ammeter is what a galvanometer is. And I had to have you come way up to the table, and when I was moving my magnet in and out, it was just barely showing up. Well, that's because I had to work on the buttons. And so I finally got the buttons working. And then I worked on the needle, and I broke it. But that's okay. We've got some new sensors, and I should have been using my new sensors to start with. So all I have here is we've got our current sensor. And I'll zero it out again here in just a minute. If I want to generate electricity by a process called electromagnetic, can you finish that statement? Induction, electromagnetic induction. All I need is a coil. Here's our guitar string question of just a minute ago. I need a coil, and I need a magnetic field, and I need one other thing. There are three things required. I need a coil wire, I need a magnetic field, and something else. We're trying to in, we're trying to produce a voltage difference, a current through it. What? My coil is my circuit. So my coil is my circuit. I'm just going to set that thing right there. I've got a coil and I've got a magnet, and there is nothing happening. Now that's my sensor going on. I need a change in something. I need a change in the number of turns in my coil. I need a change in. Can you tell me something else I could change? Now I'm creating a current. Now I'm creating a current. That's a result. Starting with magnetic field strength, I could have a magnet that changes the magnetic field strength. This is a permanent one, so it can't change. But if I had an electromagnet, I could change the strength. So there's another thing I could change. What else could I change? I could change the size of the loop. If I had a coil that changed size of the loop, Mentioned how many turns already. Can you think of anything else? In fact, you haven't mentioned the change that I'm going to do to make it work. I have an emotion, rotation going on. Now, I'm not going to do rotation. I'm going to do a motion of just moving my magnet in and out of that. But I need some change in orientation. Rotate it, move the magnet. I need motion in some way. Let's see. If we start this thing playing now, okay, I am going to move it in, stop it, move it out, stop it, move it in, stop it, move it out, stop it, and you don't see anything simply because of the scale. So there we go, we auto scaled it. I moved it in, what happened right over here? I got a current. I moved it out, what's different about the second spike? Opposite direction. So this would be a current the negative direction, current the positive direction. I moved it in, I moved it out. So you can see the current that was going on. Now let me go ahead and play it again while we've got it scaled to a size that you can see. So here I go. I move it in, I stop it, I move it out, I stop it. I move it in and out and in and out and in and out. If I go too fast, my sensor won't keep up. What am I generating? It's not very smooth in this bright section here, but what am I generating right here? Okay, kind of sinusoidal. What type of current am I generating? Alternating current. If I just go one way, direct current. Then I went one way, direct current the other. But then if I move it in and out, I get alternating current that's going on. So there we can see we are generating electricity. Now, if you want, you can have your roommate. I'll let you borrow this. Well, I won't, but get your own. And you can sit there at night so that you can have him generate some electricity for your, oh, let's put it on the meter. So you can generate some electricity. It's a little hard to see, but you can see the numbers. Um, that's why we use crafts. 
But anyway, um, you can generate electricity. Right there is a generator. How do generators like Swepco, Flint Creek Power Plant right out there that you can see the tower on, how do they generate electricity that powers the lights that we are enjoying? With a generator made up of the exact same components of this simple thing right here, a coil and a magnetic field. Now, they're going to have much bigger coils and much stronger magnetic fields, and what do they use, do you know, to get the motion? They use motion as well. They use coal, they burn coal to create steam, and they simply send steam past a turbine, fan blades, a turbine, and that's what rotates it. And so they are spinning, probably they're spinning a coil inside a magnetic field. That's how they're generating electricity. That's how all power plants work. No matter what the source of energy is, and here it's coal that creates steam. No matter what the source of energy is, all of them use the same simple process of a coil and a magnetic field and create electricity. That's how we create or generate electricity. If you have a nuclear power plant, they simply are using the heat from the radioactivity that goes on to generate steam that drives the turbines. And if we have a hydroelectric plant with a dam and water, and we back up the water, we simply let the falling water and gravity spin the turbines that make your change in motion. So all electric power plants, generating plants, work on the same simple principle, electromagnetic conduction. They take some sort of mechanical energy, generally we spin turbines, so that spins a coil in a magnetic field, and convert it into electrical energy. Induction, it's called induction, electromagnetic induction, so we can convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. It produces a continuously changing EMF. Why is it? Because my orientation changes as I spin the thing. So just like I was moving in and out, it's a continuously changing EMF, positive and negative, and positive and negative going on. So here is a generator idea that we are going to try our right-hand rule on, and we are going to see if we can make this thing work. So let's start with picture A right over here. Now I have blue lines represent my magnetic field. And you can see point A, point B, C, and D are different locations on the wire. And then this kind of red curved arrow is the rotation. So I'm rotating, if I'm standing on the left side of the board looking right, I'm rotating counterclockwise around. And so the arrow by A and C, they're showing you the motion that that part of the wire is undergoing at that moment. Why is there zero current or induced EMF? Why is there no potential difference even though this wire is moving at this instant in time in picture A? Can you tell me? Correct. Point A is moving parallel. Here's the magnetic field. Wire A is moving parallel to the magnetic field. C is doing the same thing, just going the other direction, parallel to the magnetic field. How about D over here? Wire D is moving parallel to that magnetic field. So it's not cutting across the magnetic field lines. That flux that has to cut across those magnetic field lines if I'm going to generate power. Now we move over to B. Now, parts B and C on the B and D on the wire are never generating electricity because my magnetic field is like this and they're just moving in this orientation. They're just moving like this. So they're not generating anything. But A and B, A and C start to generate electricity. Let's do A, try your right hand. Fingers are supposed to go what direction? Direction of magnetic field. Thumb is supposed to go in what direction? We have, no, not current, right hand rule, um, maybe they called it the alternating rule, but that shows us the force, the right hand rule that shows us the force that will be placed on a charge, because that tells us the direction the current's going to flow. Now, do you remember what the thumb is supposed to point in? Direction of something. Direction of what? The direction the charge is moving. The wires have the charges in them. So if I'm using my right hand rule, my fingers are going into the board, my thumb is pointing straight down, and out of my palm is the direction a positive would move. 
which means that's the direction current is, because that's conventional current. And so if I trace that around, if I trace from A, I'm going around, to D, to C, it comes through that first loop and it connects to the second one. I don't know if you can tell that. These are called slip rings, and the little connection is called brushes. These are slip rings and brushes. So that current A, D, C, B comes through the first loop, hits the second one, and passes. There's the arrow moving in the direction we expect it to go. If I did C, let's try C and see if it works. My finger's into the board. My thumb is pointing up because C is moving up. So out of my palm, moving from C to B, is that the same direction that side A was doing in the loop? Yeah, over here in A, our thumb was down. It was forcing it clockwise around. Here, thumbs up, it's forcing it clockwise around. So A and C are generating the electricity, the current, in the same direction. When I come down to C, why is it showing zero on our meter? Because the motion of my charges, my wire, is all parallel at that instant to my magnetic field lines, the magnetic flux. Nothing is generated. And it's not until I get it back over here where it is cutting through the lines again. And if you use your right-hand rule over here, then it's going to reverse the direction. We're going to try it out. My fingers in the direction of my magnetic field into the board. My hand is down. My thumb is down. So coming out of my palm, moving from C to D to A to B, here comes the current. C, D, A, B, and that one is connected to the first loop, so it's forcing it this direction. And notice pictures B and D, they are opposite in direction. When you have a generator that is made up of a coil, slip ring, and brushes, and you rotate that in a magnetic field, it produces what kind of electricity? Alternating current. It produces alternating current. The simplest generators are alternating current generators. We're going to play in a little bit with a generator, a couple of different kinds of generators. And we will be generating electricity a little bit more efficiently than just with my coil and my magnet that was going on. A generator is used to convert kinetic energy into electrical energy. A generator consists of four parts. A magnet, or electromagnet, a coil of wire on a freely rotating shaft, a set of electrically conductive slip rings, and a set of electrically conductive brushes. Next. I want the teacher to work. That's not good. When the crank is turned, the coil rotates within the magnetic field created by the magnet. When this happens, an electromotive force, or EMF, is induced within the coil of wire, and a current begins to flow. The current leaves the coil of wire through the slip rings and the brushes and can be used to do electrical work. The induced EMF is not constant. It changes as the cross-sectional area of the loop that faces the magnetic field changes. As the rotating loop moves through the position where it is perpendicular to the field, the wires that make up the loop all move in a direction nearly parallel to the magnetic field lines. At that point in the coil's rotation, no magnetic field lines are being cut by the moving wires and no EMF is induced. When the rotating loop is parallel to the magnetic field, the maximum number of magnetic field lines is being cut and the EMF is at a maximum. As the rotation continues, the loop again becomes perpendicular to the magnetic field and the EMF drops to zero. As the loop again reaches horizontal, the maximum number of magnetic field lines is again being cut, but because the long sides of the loop are now moving in the opposite direction, the EMF is reversed. As the loop continues to rotate, the EMF and the current reverse in direction, resulting in alternating current, or AC. Most of the electricity used as an energy source is alternating current. All right. So they had this lovely picture here of a hand generator hooked up to a light bulb, and it was hooked up to a voltmeter as well. It was generating electricity. Now it's unfortunate that Hayden is gone because this is one of his favorite toys. I don't know if you have ever visited Hayden's house and they have pulled out one of these things. 
is the hand generator. So I'm going to need some volunteers in just a little bit. But first off, we are going to take and connect it up to a voltmeter. Now, what type of voltage does this produce? Or current does it produce? Alternating current. So that would have been a better question for me to ask. My other side. Now, if you notice this device, it has magnets. That's what these U things are. They're just horseshoe magnets on the outside. And down here inside, it's a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but you can come back up later. And it's it's a coil. It's a coil like this, but smaller. It has smaller wire in it. It has many, many rounds to it. So my crank, all I'm doing with my crank is turning that coil inside the magnetic field. Now I'm going to go ahead and put my multimeter on, and let's see if we can't generate some electricity. Can you see it? i got to get where I can see it. So let's see if we can produce... Hey, can you read a number? I am generating... That's voltage! Can you, on a hand crank generator, create pretty good potential difference? Hey, I got 62. You see it? That's 62 <laughs> volts. That's real electricity. Maybe it's real electricity. We'll see if it's real electricity. Now, I've worn myself out, so I need a volunteer. I need somebody who thinks they can light up a light bulb. Or maybe you don't even think you can light up a light bulb. I need a volunteer anyway. All right, Brandon, you're the man. And these lights aren't exactly spotlights, so I'll turn off the overhead lights and maybe it'll... Oh, you can probably see even without it, but... Let's get Brandon out of the way with his hand crank generator. Here, come move over here. And I've hooked up the first lamp. You want to hold that wooden... Yeah, there you go. That works just fine. Crank away. You can watch the light bulb. Is he doing it? Just don't break my handle. You're doing good. You're doing good. All right. Let up one. So don't worry yourself out because we're going to... We're going to hook up two now. So let's see. Yeah, we'll change it after Brandon gets two. And we'll get a new person. All right. So I put that up. Let me disconnect this one. So we just have two. And these two light bulbs are connected in series or parallel? They're connected in series is what we have. So we have just doubled the resistance, essentially. All right, can you do it? Oh, yeah. No problem. Okay, that's good. I need the next person because we don't want to have Brandon sore arms the next day. I got three. Come on up here. Next volunteer. Don't volunteer a neighbor, just you come up. Oh, come on, you people. Three, one. Somebody try three. Get involved. Just try it. You're in like literally right there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got three. We'll do four. Don't run anywhere. Don't run anywhere. And I don't know if you can tell the difference in the resistance to cranking between three and four. Try out four. Barely got. There we go. We got four. Okay. We're generating some electricity. That will light up a light bulb. <laughs> you didn't need your sunglasses probably, but... Alternating current. Electric current that changes direction at regular intervals. 
Alternating current can be converted to direct current by using a device called a commutator to change the direction of current. In just a minute, we're going to look at another little generator that has a commutator on it because this was generating alternating current and my multimeter could read that alternating current. Our sensors read direct current is what our sensors are set up for. So we'll see what a commutator looks like. As the loop of wire rotates in the magnetic field of an AC generator, the EMF induced in the loop alternates in direction, producing an alternating current. An AC generator supplies current to an outside circuit by means of slip rings and conducting brushes. The DC generator must have some way of creating direct current from the alternating current in the loop of wire. To achieve this, the wire loop is connected to a split slip ring or commutator. At the point in the loop's rotation when the current has dropped to zero and is about to change direction, each half of the split ring comes into contact with the brush that was previously in contact with the other half of the split ring. This half cycle will start again with the same polarity as the first, resulting in no change in the polarity of the output current of the generator. The output current varies in magnitude, but not in direction. So I don't know how well you can see this, but you notice on the AC generator we had two slip rings. And as you rotate it then, we saw how we got alternating current out of it. On a DC generator, there is one ring and it's called a commutator. And it is cut across in half. So that, as we are generating power in one direction, here comes my first nice little bump here of the current coming up. And then it goes down to where it's getting parallel. Um, the motion of it is parallel, which means the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field. I'm going back to zero. And the brush then, as I get halfway around, switches the sides of the commutator ring that it is touching. And so when in my loop that I'm rotating, the current changes direction, well, the brushes have changed sides of the loop that they are connected to. And so it repeats the current on the same side. Now it goes zero to max to zero to max to zero to max to zero. It's not a smooth direct current, but it is direct current that is going on. So right over here, I have a generator with a commutator on it. So let me see if I can turn it. You can see, looking where I'm pointing here, that you see black plastic instead of the silver metal. That's the commutator ring. And if I rotate it halfway, you can see the metal that's making the connection on my commutator ring. And as I rotate it, it goes past the splits on that commutator. And so these copper um, tabs of wire here are my brushes, and they're just resting against it. I have two permanent magnets right over here, so they're creating a magnetic field, and we are going to rotate our coil inside that magnetic field connected to our commutator, and we are going to see if we can't register some direct current out of this, but it's not smooth direct current, but it is direct current that's coming out of it. Uh, I've got my wrong things. So let's hook it back up where we can see our sensor. Here are my sensor wires. Now I'm going to attempt to capture this. I didn't have a chance to run through these all by class after I broke my galvanometer. So. You're the guinea pigs. Now, what I want to do on this one, I want to change my sample rate. I've got it 10 samples per second, but I don't think that's going to be good enough. So I'm going to try 50 samples per second. And we probably don't need to do it for 18 seconds. We'll do it for 10 seconds long. And we'll see if we can't zero out our sensor. Looks pretty close to zero already. We'll get a new one. We don't care about that data. It probably just ruined it all, didn't it? You guys have experienced this, haven't you? When you're setting up your sensors. 
What did I want to do it for? 10 seconds? All right. Zero my sensor. It's not going to go when I do this this time. All right. So. We lose our connection. All right, now we're connected. So I'm going to run it. I'm going to spin my generator. And then we'll stop it. Am I getting direct current? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a I've got a little bit of, of residual stuff down there in the bottom of the end, don't I? Mm. But it's all on one side. Not very smooth, but it's all on one side. And notice I'm going from zero maximum to zero, maximum to zero. So that's what's happening on this. Actually, what you should be doing, looking the ones in between. That's where I spun it three times. Sorry. It's these little ones. Zero, maximum, zero, maximum, zero. All those little things are my direct current. Well, it's very close. So if I spread it apart a little bit. I forgot how you do that. How do we do that on our graph? That's how we do it. Graph options. If I started at, uh-oh. I don't know what I started at. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, but I could zoom in on that, and we could make it work a little bit better. Motors. Now that we have generated some electricity, let's see if we can't learn what a motor is like. Machines convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. Reverse process of a generator. Motors use a similar arrangement to that of generators. Let's not talk about back EMF yet. I wonder if I can back up just one. Let's look at a motor for just a minute. You're now looking at a motor. Is this a different device than I showed you for a generator? No. A motor and a generator are exactly the same things. In a generator, I input mechanical energy to spin a coil in my magnetic field. And I get out what? What do I get out in my generator? Electrical energy, electric current. In a motor, I put in electrical current. When I put in electrical current, it creates an electromagnet on this coil right here. What happens when I put current through a coil? I get an electromagnet. Now, magnets are either attracted or repelled with other magnets, right? This electromagnet that we are going to make here in just a minute by passing electricity into it is going to have a north and a south pole to it, just like these permanent magnets will have a north and a south pole. And so they will be, if this is a south and this is a north, this south will be attracted to that north. And if this is a south, then down here that's a north. And if that's a north, then over here is a south. So my north at the bottom is attracted to that south over here on, the, on your right. And so it moves it because I have made an electromagnet and it's attracted. Now, my commutator ring is nice in this case as well, because when I get over here, it's going to switch the brushes on the sides of the ring that it is contacting. And so where it used to be a south attracted to a north, this now becomes a north. And what do those two north do? Repel each other. So it will push it away. And every half turn, it switches. And so it will continually attract and repel, attract and repel. Some of you need to go to bed earlier so that you get more sleep, so that you are awake, not to mention any names. Now, let's hook it up. And let me put my electromagnet, which is just my coil right there in the center. And we are going to, I've got it hooked up to direct current. We are going to turn it on. And now it's a motor. That's all a motor is, is the same thing as a generator. 
It is just a coil of wire inside a magnetic field. I supply electricity to it so that the electromagnet attracts and repels to that magnetic field that it is sitting in. All motors are just like that as far as their basic makeup to it. And so you can take, oh, I should have had, I had a little motor here the other day. Remember when it was sitting on my thing and I went and put it away? That little motor, if I supply electricity to it, it'll spin the shaft. But what do you think happens if I spin the shaft? It creates electricity. It becomes a generator. So it generates electricity. Um, Friday, we are going to finish up chapter 20 and you are going to have a little lab dealing with generators that go along with it. Now we can put this idea of back EMF along. What is EMF? It's what? Potential difference. It stands for electro electromotive force. It creates a voltage, a potential difference. Think of this back as a generator. When I spun this, it created a current through these brushes, right? When it is a motor running, is this coil spinning in an electric field? When that motor was running, was this coil spinning in this field, in this magnetic field? Did I say electric? Yeah, that coil is spinning. Is it acting as a generator? Yes. A motor, while it is spinning, is generating electricity in the opposite direction of what the input electricity is making it spin. Lenz's law again. Because when I create a magnetic field, that magnetic field induced is going to oppose the magnetic field that induced it. Lenz's law tells us it's going to be what we call back EMF. Current generated or potential difference generated opposite of what was input into it. When you have an electric motor that is spinning at high RPM, running smoothly, it takes a little amount of current to keep it going. If you put a heavy load on it so it slows it down, then it takes a lot of current to make it go. In fact, what you can do to a motor is put too much of a load on it so that it is too hard for it to spin. It draws so much current that you burn out the motor. Burning out a motor is putting a motor on too heavy of a load so it can't turn it. And it draws all the power it possibly can from wherever you have it plugged in. And if that's too much, it burns out the motor. But once it gets spinning, it is generating electricity, putting it back into the system, if you will. It doesn't go back into the wall because the back EMF is less than the electricity you're putting into it. But if I'm putting into it 5 volts and my back EMF is 3 volts, what's the difference between those two? 2 volts. It is only taking 2 volts to operate that motor during that process. That's what back EMF is. Since a motor and a generator are really the same thing, a motor, while it is operating, is acting as a generator that generates back EMF. A DC motor uses direct current from an electrical energy source, such as a battery, to rotate a conducting coil in a magnetic field, producing mechanical energy from electrical energy. Current from the battery passes through a loop of wire called an armature, which rotates between the poles of a permanent magnet. Because the armature carries a current, it becomes magnetized and interacts with the permanent magnets. The magnetic forces on the armature cause it to rotate. You can use the right hand rule to check that the forces are in the direction needed to rotate the loop as shown. When the armature reaches the position shown here, current is briefly interrupted. Rotational inertia keeps the armature moving until the battery contacts to the commutator are reversed by the rotation causing current in the armature to reverse direction. The armature is now magnetized so that the magnetic forces of the permanent magnets on it are in the right direction to keep it rotating until it reaches the second position where the gaps in the commutator pass the brushes and current is again reversed. Thus, every time the motor turns through half a cycle, the current in the armature reverses direction and the armature keeps rotating in the same direction as before. Mutual inductance. 
the ability of one circuit <clears throat> to an e induce an EMF in a nearby circuit in the presence of a changing current is called mutual inductance. We are going to understand, hopefully, mutual inductance. Based on the same principles, what we have done is we have learned the principles of electromagnetic induction, and now we're just going to apply them in several different cases. I'm going to step you through the idea that is happening. If I put current through this coil, got a nail in it just to strengthen the magnetic field, I just gave the answer. If I push current through this coil, what do I induce here or create here? A magnetic field. If I run current through a coil, we get a magnetic field. Now, let me change the story. If I have a coil in the presence of a changing magnetic field, what will I create? Current. I'll get current going. So what I'm going to do, instead of using my magnet to change the magnetic field, I am going to put this coil inside this other coil so that if I change the current in this first coil will this second coil be in the presence of a changing magnetic field I'll say it again if I change the current in this first coil will this second coil be in the presence of a changing magnetic field yes if I change the current here, as soon as I put current, I'm creating a magnetic field, right? So if I change this current, am I changing the magnetic field in this first one? Yeah. So I have this changing magnetic field that I've made from this first coil. Is the second coil now in the presence of a changing magnetic field? Yeah. yeah. So what will the second coil do if it's in the presence of a changing magnetic field? What does the second coil do if it's in the presence of a changing magnetic field? It creates a current. That is called mutual inductance. These two coils are not connected to each other. But by making a changing current in the first coil, I can create a current in the second coil. At least theory says that, according to electromagnetic induction, that is what should be going on over here. So, we are going to put my source away. What kind of current do I want to put into my first coil? I'm pausing because that was not the right answer. <laughs> what kind of current do I want to put into my first coil? Think of the story I just told you. which was a very interesting story. I need what kind of current? I need alternating current. I need changing current, right? I need changing current. Can you tell me why I need changing current? I just told you. I'm trying, I'm trying to generate electricity. Why do I need changing current? To create a changing magnetic field. Just passing current through it creates a magnetic field. But the only way, remember, I induce current is if I have a change going on. One of my first questions today was, what does it take to, um, for electromagnetic induction? And we needed a change in something. That was the third ingredient. We needed a coil, a circuit, a coil. We needed a magnetic field, and we needed a change. And we could change several things. I changed the orientation, the motion before. Now we're not going to change that. We're going to be changing our magnetic field. So in my first coil, I have hooked it up over here to alternating current coming out of this. And so we are going to see if I turn on alternating current, will I generate some current over here? See if we're still connected where you can see my sensor. Is it active? Yeah. So I'm going to go over to my graph, and we are going to, I don't know what it was set up on before, but we are going to start it out. 
and I am going to change on alternating current. Then I'm going to turn it off. Did I get, you can watch it. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. Wow, that was interesting. All right. Was I getting a current in my secondary coil? My sensor's hooked up at the secondary coil. Yes, I was getting a current in my secondary coil. Now, my graph didn't come out very good. Maybe I'm not sampling soon enough for it. But here is what happens to it. I'll try to just set it on the meter, and I'll talk through that I'm turning it on and off. And watch the meter. Oh, it's going to be delayed for you, isn't it, a little bit? I turn it on. It's on. I get some current. It is still on. My current should drop to zero. It's not. Oh. That's why I wasn't getting what I wanted. Let me change it. Uh, do you know why? I'm going to change it to direct current. That's why I wasn't illustrating what I wanted it to illustrate right over here. I'm going to turn on, and I'm going to turn off. And I'm going to turn on, and I'm going to turn off. That wasn't doing what I wanted to either. I'm not sampling fast enough. All right, this one can't sample fast enough to see what happens. Sorry. When I turn the current on, I have changed the current. And what happens is you get a blip of current. And while it is on, it will go back to zero because my current is no longer changing. Matt and Ashton, I need you guys awake. If I then turn it off, I'll get a blip of current in the opposite direction. Because when I turn direct current on, I change the current. I get electricity induced. But while it stays on, I'm not changing the current. So it goes back to zero. Then when I turn it off, is there a change in current when you go from, let's say, two amps to zero? Is there a change? Yeah. And anytime there's a change, I don't care the direction, anytime there's a change, there is current going to be induced. And so where I had it hooked up a little bit ago was to the alternating current where I'm continually changing. And so I should have been continually inducing a current in my secondary coil. Mutual inductance is what it's called. Here is a formula for mutual inductance. EMF, the first formula you already know. EMF, and let's look at the second coil, is equal to negative M M is called the mutual inductance times change in current divided by change in time. First formula is the one that we're talking about rotating, generating electricity, or generating potential difference when we're rotating a coil in a magnetic field. Already have that one. Second one, M is the mutual inductance. It's measured in units called Henry's. I know it, you may not believe me, but it is. It's measured in Henry's. It was named after a guy whose last name was Henry. I don't remember his first name right now. But mutual inductance is measured in Henry's. Second formula gives it to us over here. When a current changes in one circuit, it can induce an EMF in a separate nearby circuit. In this circuit, the coils are wound around an iron core whose magnetic properties strengthen the magnetic fields. As the circuit is closed, the current changes, which produces a changing magnetic field in the primary coil. The changing magnetic field induces a momentary EMF in the secondary coil. When the switch is opened, an induced EMF of opposite polarity occurs in the secondary coil. The current, and therefore the magnetic field in the first circuit, must be changing in order for an EMF to be present in the secondary circuit. A steady current in the primary circuit will not generate an EMF in the secondary circuit. So you notice the switch was being closed and open. And when the switch was closed, current was changing, we induced a current in the secondary coil. When it opened, the same thing happened. When it sits in either the closed state or the open state, there is no electricity that is going to be induced in the secondary coil. Effective current. When we talk about that alternating current that goes one direction and then goes the other direction, the effective current is where the root mean square current, it's called, or RMS current. 
it's not at the maximum, so maybe I have a maximum of three amps, but that's not the effective current in my circuit because some of the time it's zero, and then it's rising to three amps, and then it's falling to zero. And so I don't have three amps just because the maximum was three amps. What we measure in alternating current, alternating um, voltage with alternating current is called the RMS current, RMS potential difference. It gives the same heating effect or it uses up the same amount of power as the corresponding value of direct current does. What the RMS value does is it gives us a number that can be compared equally to a direct current number. So when my multimeter is measuring my current or my voltage in direct current, it's measuring the actual number because direct current is steady. When my multimeter is set to alternating current, I am measuring voltage, potential difference, it is not measuring one number because it is changing continually. It's measuring the RMS current. It's not showing me the maximum, it's not showing me the minimum, it's showing me the RMS. Here's the formula. Potential, or current RMS equals the maximum divided by the square root of 2. Now if you take 1 divided by square root of 2, you get approximately 0.707. That's where it comes from, 0.707 times the max. That's from 1 divided by square root of 2. But we use the square root of 2 number, and then we round off depending on our significant digits. So, RMS current and RMS EMF, which is voltage, in an AC circuit are the important measures of the characteristics of the AC circuit. It's not the maximum value. It's the RMS value because that tells you what is going to be the equivalent. So right over here, they have given you both RMS formulas. They're the same thing. You take the maximum either voltage and divide by the square root of 2, or you take the maximum current and divide by the square root of 2, and you get the RMS current. So we're going to try this a minute, and I've got a multimeter that is working now. Earlier it was showing like 160 volts when I plugged it into the wall. Well, my meter was off. I had a low battery. So here if I take this and I put it into the wall, I am going to register. We'll see if you can see. Make sure I've got it all right before I plug it into the wall. All right. I am going to register. Can you read it? 119 point. Eight, it's fluctuating a little. Let's say it jumped 120. Let's say 120. That is RMS voltage. That is not the maximum voltage that is coming out of the wall. So we're going to take that 120 volts and do this on your paper real quick. I am measuring VRMS that is 120.0 volts. I want to know what is the true maximum voltage that is actually occurring in this alternating circuit. Well, let's go back to the beginning. My formula would be RMS value is going to equal to the maximum value divided by the square root of 2. Ashton, what do I do? You said multiply by square root of 2 to get rid of it right over here. And so if I'm going to take square root of 2 times my 120, you are going to get how much? 84. It shouldn't be 84. 169.1? 169.7 volts. Approximately 170 volts is the maximum that is coming out of the wall. The power dissipated as a direct current passes through a resistor is equal to the product of the square of the current and the resistance. This equation can be applied to circuits involving alternating current, but with one minor variation. Because the value of an alternating current varies throughout its cycle, the maximum value for the alternating current cannot be used. Rather, the RMS, or root mean square value, for the current must be used. 
The RMS current is equal to the maximum value of the alternating current divided by the square root of 2. The power dissipated in a resistor by an alternating current can be calculated using the equation shown here. It's important to recognize that power is dissipated in a resistor regardless of the instantaneous direction of the alternating current. If you think back to that sinusoidal curve of the current that was going through, and they said you can't use the max, you must use, and they drew a line down there that was a little bit lower than the max. That line is the average value of that sinusoidal curve. That's where the square root of 2 comes from that we were using in our problem. So let's try this sample problem. Is the RMS like the most efficient use of the current? RMS is the actual value of that current. So that's why we have to use the RMS, because it's the actual value of it. Generator, maximum output EMF of 205 volts. So I need to know that I am talking about max here of 205 volts. Connected to a 150 ohm resistor. We'll probably get to include some previous equations that we learned. 150 ohm resistor. Calculate the RMS potential difference. Okay. Remember how to do that? Oh, I put 150, said 115, didn't I? Thank you. Do you remember how I calculate the RMS? Max, max, max square root of two. divided by the square root of 2. So I need to take the max voltage divided by the square root of 2. So if we take our 205 and divide it by our square root of 2, we get how much? And three significant figures. So it would be... 145 volts. There's our RMS, which is the actual value that I need to use in all calculations. Calculate the RMS potential difference. Find the RMS current through the resistor. What formula do I know that involves resistance and potential difference in current? R equals, what is it? Delta V over I. So if I'm going to get the current, we're going to multiply by the current. We're going to divide by the resistance. So my potential difference number I need to use is going to be that 145 volts because it is the RMS current that is significant to us. It's the only one that is important for our calculations. Resistor, 115 ohms. So what type of current do we have moving through this resistor? 1.26, three significant figures, 1.26 amps that is coming through this system. Get my picture back. There they just drew a diagram that went with it, and we'll see if our calculations are going to be correct. Current EMF, they make me fit. Push too many buttons. There we go. Oh, do they want to know the max? Mm -hmm. We better go back. They gave us the answer there, but we better go back and finish that up. If I want to know the max current, I do know the formula is current RMS or anything RMS equals the max divided by the square root of 2. So we are going to take our RMS times the square root of 2. So our 1.26 amps times the square root of 2. What number? 1.78? 1.78 amps. If they do not tell you, and it is an alternating current circuit, and they ask you for the current that runs through it, which answer will you give? If they don't say which answer to give, they ask just for, what's the current that goes through it? RMS. You're going to give the RMS value. The RMS value is the one that compares AC, DC, so it's all consistent. So it's the RMS value. So that's why that meter that is running, when we said we had 120 volts, that's RMS. Whenever we talk about it in AC, we're talking about the RMS value. We're not talking about the maximum value in it. Transformers. 
What type of potential difference is in those big high tension power lines that that guy on the helicopter hopped on and ran around? Do you remember the numbers that we were saying? 250,000 volts, 300,000 volts. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of volts. What was coming out of the wall right down here? 120 volts. So how do I get from 300,000 volts to 120 volts? A transformer is a device that increases or decreases the EMF of alternating current. And transformers use mutual inductance. This little setup right here where I had the nail and the little coil inside this big yellow coil is a transformer. And we'll see why it's a transformer in a minute. It uses mutual inductance. We're going to supply voltage at one amount. We're going to get voltage at a different amount out of this second one over here. Transformer equation. There it is. The secondary voltage is equal to the ratio of the number of turns. Number of turns in the second coil over the number of turns in the first coil times the original voltage, original potential difference. We have what are called step up or step down transformers. If I have this blue coil and we could count the turns, maybe there's 20 of them right over there. And then I count the turns on this yellow one. Maybe there are 200 of them in this. So my secondary is 200. My primary that I've supplied is 20. What's 200 divided by 20? 10. I have 10 times as much voltage coming out on the secondary as I did on the primary. That would be a step up transformer. If I reverse the process and put my electricity into the 200 turn and I got it out of the 20 turn, well, my secondary was 20. What's 20 divided by my 200 primary? One tenth. So if I put in whatever voltage, I'm going to get out one tenth. That's a step down transformer. And that's what happens when you take that 300,000 volts, they go through step down transformers. And there's the formula that will tell us how much it will step down or how much it will step up. And notice our diagram. That's mutual inductance. That's what makes transformers work. It's the changing magnetic field from this AC coil in the presence of my secondary coil. Since it's a changing magnetic field, I generate electricity over here. And this is the ratio that we generate electricity with that transformer equation. takes an alternating current as an input and produces an alternating current at a different potential difference as an output. In its simplest form, a transformer consists of an iron core wrapped with two separate windings of wire. One, referred to as the primary winding, is attached to the input AC potential difference. The other coil, here containing a resistor, is called the secondary winding, or the output. A magnetic field is generated within the core in accordance with Faraday's law due to the varying current in the primary. This varying magnetic field generates a potential difference, again according to Faraday's law, in the secondary winding. Because the changing magnetic field through the two coils are equal, as are the cross-sectional areas, the only terms in the two equations that differ are the number of coils and the potential differences. This allows us to derive the equation shown here, relating the number of turns to the potential difference in each of the coils. When N2 is greater than N1, the secondary potential difference is greater than that of the primary, and the transformer is called a step-up transformer. When N2 is less than N1, the secondary potential difference is less than that of the primary, and the transformer is called a step-down transformer. Before we talk about the efficiency of transformers, let's look at some transformers right up here. Go ahead and stand up and come up here so that you are close enough actually to read the multimeter that is going to be registering some things. Here is the basic core of what a transformer is like. I have coils 
around an iron core or a ferromagnetic core. So we just have coils around a ferromagnetic core right over here. I am going to have a secondary coil in the magnetic field from this first one. Now, what type of electricity or current do I want to put into that primary coil? If I'm going to induce a potential difference over here, alternating. Excellent answer. Now, why? <laughs> why do I need to put alternating current in my first coil? I'm trying to generate a potential difference over here, a current over here from the potential difference. Why do I need alternating current here? Anybody? Don't wait for Brandon, who's getting the right answer first. I need to have a change. I need to have a changing magnetic field. Otherwise, there's no current. Otherwise, there's no current right over here. So, where did all my wires go that I can connect up to measure this thing? First thing we are going to do is we are going to measure <laughs> what type of potential difference and I need a couple of calculators. A couple of you grab your calculators because you're going to do just some calculations on the fly for me so that we can get some answers. All right, first thing I want to do is set my multimeter on alternating current. And I am going to have, I need Jay Young, come around behind here, would you? You're going to be my assistant. I want you to touch this red one to the bottom one. Doesn't really matter. Touch one to the bottom one, touch the other to the top, right there where the metal is. And go ahead and just hold them there. Now when I turn this on, I'm going to have AC potential difference coming here, and we're going to see what the AC voltage is right over there. So look at the multimeter. You're not going to be shocked. Look at the multimeter. This is not going to worsen my taste. I guess I better plug it into the wall before I generate anything. Okay, I'm going to turn it on. Did not, oh, I have it set on 500. That's why nothing showed up. All right, now I have it. The maximum is 200. Turn it on. What potential difference did I get? 0.3. Now I want you. You're good. Thank you very much. So I'm going about 0.3, and we'll assume we'll continue at about 0.3. It may not stay exactly 0.3. I have my multimeter now on the secondary coil. The, these two numbers mean 18, 8 turns of 14 gauge wire. This is 55 turns of 16 gauge wire. The gauge of the wire tells me the size of the wire. The smaller the number, the bigger the wire. You may be able to tell this 14 gauge is a little bit thicker wire than that 16 gauge. That's all the second number means. What we're interested in is, is the first number. I've got a primary of 8, a secondary of 55. What will I do to convert that 0.3 into the expected voltage that I get right over here? That's right. My ratio is 55 to 8, secondary to primary. So take 55 divided by 8, multiply it by our original 0.3, and you get what number? Approximately 2. Now, if I'm 100% efficient, I'm going to get exactly 2. Now, sitting up on the board here, it says real transformers are, what's that next word? No. Not perfectly efficient. We're not going to get 2. What are we going to get? I don't know. Let's see. Read the multimeter right over there. I turn it on. What do we get? 1.8. That's not too far off from 2. We could calculate the efficiency. We won't do it right now. If I switch this from a 55 turn, so we're done with that one, let's change it to a 110 turn. Now that's 18 gauge. We are 110 over 8 times our 0.3. That's our new ratio. We're doing step-up transformers. Four? I would expect, think a minute, I would expect four. I did have 55 to 8. What's 110 compared to 55? Twice. I just doubled. I'm doubling the ratio. 
So I should expect to be about four. Am I going to be exactly four? No, why not? I'm not perfectly efficient. It's exactly right. So I turn it on, look at the multimeter over there, and we get, hey, 3.9. That wasn't very far off from our four. So, okay. I don't know why that one was working a little more efficiently, but it was. Let's get rid of that one. I'm going to change to how many turns? Can you read the numbers? What would you expect? Eight. I have doubled again from the four. 220 is double the 110. I would expect, you run through the formula, you expect about 8 volts that are going to come out of this thing if I'm 100% efficient, and what do we get? Hey, 8.3. I bet I'm not exactly 0.3 anymore. Was it? 8.25. Oh, is that what it was? 8.3? Wow, that's impressive. We're pretty efficient on our little thing right over here. So, if I change it to, what can we do next? I bet you can't guess the number. 440. Do 440 over 8 times our 0.3. Now, again, we're just assuming 0.3 is the beginning. And as they're doing that, look at the size of the wire. Notice this first one is still 14 gauge. This is now 25 gauge. Notice how it's much thinner. We're going to hold a bunch more winding, so we need smaller wire. Higher the gauge number, the smaller the wire is. What's our number? 16.5. So we turn it on. Thank you. We plug it in close these things up so I can get a little bit of connection there and we turn it on and we get why did I get nothing out of it man that won't matter to me it'll just tell me negative or positive just the direction that's going oh see this nice little button over here that's the fuse I got it too hot so we'll turn it on again and we got 17.1 now, what's happening is this isn't providing exactly 0.3 voltage on my original, is what's happening. We'd really need another multimeter right over here to see exactly what are we doing on this while it's on, while that one is registering. But hopefully, yeah, we're not going to be over 100% efficient. In fact, really, we're less than 100% efficient. Now I do this one. I've got 880 turns, so we should be approximately, what's my voltage? about 33 volts in our step-up transformers that we have made that are simply two coils mutual inductance going on so we turn this one on and we get there you go it's approximately 33 it's 34 point whatever it was all right go ahead and have a seat so there's a transformer if i turn them around if i switch this from eight turns in the primary and 880 in the secondary to 880 in the primary and eight in the secondary what happens it's a step down transformer now it's going to be so low it's not even going to pick up over here because we're only having 0.3 potential difference to start with and so with that ratio it's not going to be able to register on my multimeter but that's what they do those transformers they say typically real transformers are between 90 and 99 percent efficient well, we were pretty close with this simple one. First one was 90, and then we got to 115 percent, or whatever we got to. Ignition coils. This is just a little aside uh, application of a real life thing. In your car, what is the thing that provides the electricity so that when you turn the key, the motor starts? You've got a battery. That battery is how many volts? Do you know? 12 volts. It's a 12 volt battery. 12 volts is not near enough to turn the starter motor to crank that thing up. And so what you have is a step-up transformer. It's called an ignition coil. I wonder why they have the word coil in it. It's an ignition coil. So here's my 12-volt battery. I turn my switch on, and you notice my primary is this one on the outside that just has a few turns. And there's my secondary with all the mini turns, and that's going to go over there and start my ignition process. You read in the book, and it will tell you it steps up from 12 volts to, I think it's about 1,000 or something like that. Read it in the book as you work on your homework for sections two and three. <laughs>